an event that's being jointly hosted by the High Horsepower Summit or the HHP Summit and its media partner, HHP Insight. Uh, like I said at the outset, my name is Rich Castle, and I'm a Senior Vice President and Head of East Coast Operations for Gladstein Neandros and Associates. GNA is, the, is a clean transportation and energy firm that organizes the HHP Summit, which has grown over the past two years to become North America's largest conference focused on natural gas for off-road, high horsepower operations like marine, locomotive, um, uh, mining operations, and so on. I'm really excited to be leading today's conversation on the growing opportunities that we're seeing to use clean burning, domestically produced, low-cost natural gas as a substitute for bunker fuel. As I'll mention in my own session in a moment, I think there are some regulatory drivers that are helping make that, make that happen, as well as some really great cost drivers. I'm joined today by Paul Hergesell, the Director of LNG Logistical Operations from Pivotal LNG and Joris Van Kriege, who's the Global Sales Manager of Ship Fueling Solutions with Chart Industries. And today we're going to cover basically three topics. First, uh, how LNG can help you meet emission control area or ECA compliance regulations. Second, the latest advancements in LNG supply and bunkering for ports. And third, technical considerations for putting an LNG tank on a marine vessel. This is actually the second in an ongoing series of HHP Summit webinars. Today's webcast is really designed to provide you with a, a small preview of the program that we offer during the three-day summit. This year it's October 7th through the 9th in New Orleans. The HHP Summit agenda includes an educational track that's actually specific just to the marine industry, which will allow you to learn about the latest engines, fueling solutions, and to hear case studies from peers in the maritime sector who have been early adopters of natural gas technology. So now, before we get started, uh, I'd like to just uh, ask you to keep a few things in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, first, I encourage you to submit any questions that you have for our speakers by using the Q&A box. It's located on the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the presentations. You can uh, submit your questions, though, at any time, and we'll add them to the queue as they come in. Uh, second, a full recording of today's webinar will be available for download on the HHP Summit website. We'll send you an email link to the recording in the next, sometime in the next few days. Third, at the end of the webinar, we do ask that you take 30 seconds and, and fill out a quick survey. Your surveys, uh, your feedback is greatly appreciated and, and, and for a number of reasons, including it helps us uh, plan uh, future pre presentations and webinars and so on, and it really helps make sure that we're giving you what you, what you want and what you need. And last, uh, if there are any technical issues that come up, if you need any assistance dur during the webinar, please contact Jamie Steinberg. She's at uh, Jamie, J-A-I-M-E dot Steinberg at gladstein.org, or you can call her at 310-573-8569. And so with that, let me addition to moderating, as I said, I'm all, I'm Oh, hi, everyone. If you can just hold on, we're going to figure out what's uh, happened with Rich's sound. Uh, please just bear with us momentarily. Okay, sorry about that. There seemed to have been a, a technical glitch, and now we can get started. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, my name is Rich Castle. I'm a senior vice president with Gladstein Neandros and Associates, where I coordinate all of our public policy and, and other work in New York and Washington and manage our East Coast operations. Um, a couple things that are most pertinent to this presentation is that uh, I was actually a member of the U.S. delegation to the International Maritime Organization that secured the emission control area uh, to reduce ship emissions that I'll be talking about for the next few moments. 
I also serve now on the Environment Committee for the American Association of Port Authorities. So through that lens, I, I am working with a lot of port operators as they uh, look at LNG uh, ship and fueling uh, solutions. I'm going to speak fairly, fairly briefly to make sure we have enough time for our other panelists and for your questions. Uh, but I'm going to cover briefly a quick overview of the governing structure for air pollution from ships, MARPOL Atlantic 6. I'll introduce you to the North American Emission Control Area that was adopted in 2010. I'll speak for a moment or two about LNG as a cost-effective compliance strategy in the ECA, uh, talk a little bit about the projected growth that we see in the use of LNG, and then I'll wrap up with a couple of conclusions and pass the baton on to, on to Paul. Let me start, though, by just setting the stage. Uh, MARPOL Annex 6 is the governing document that governs air pollution from ships worldwide. It's, it's a document that is, um, is implemented by the International Maritime Organization and its member states out of its headquarters in London. And in 2008, uh, amendments were passed to MARPOL Annex 6 that will reduce sulfur levels in marine fuel worldwide. There are two structures to these sulfur reductions. The first is a gradual reduction in global sulfur limits from the current uh, cap of 4.5% uh, sulfur down to 0.5% by 2020. The second is a structure by which countries are enabled and authorized to apply to the IMO to adopt emission control areas in their waters that will reduce sulfur levels in, in marine fuel faster and to even lower levels. And so under, a, under a, an emission control uh, uh, provision, countries can go down to 1.5% sulfur uh, through 2010. That's, of course, already happened in the Baltic and in the North Sea and in around North America. In 2015, it would drop to 1%. Uh, uh, sorry, it would drop, uh, drop now to, to 1%, and in 2015, it drops to 0.1%. That's 1,000 ppm if you tend to operate in ppms. Now, MARPOL Annex 6 also enables countries to include NOx reductions in their ECAs. Uh, uh, the NOx control up until now under Tier 1 and Tier 2, which has governed engines built since 2000, did not include any uh, after-treatment-based standards. There was no assumption that SCR scrubbers or any other emission control technologies would be applied uh, to the stacks of, of large marine vessels under Tier 1 or Tier 2. However, that changes with Tier 3, which would be applicable only in uh, ECAs that have adopted the NOx provisions. Uh, and in that case, uh, there would be um, new Tier 3 NOx standards going forward from 20, 2016, which would be roughly 75% lower than Tier 2 and would, for the first time, uh, require the use of, um, of emission control technologies if a conventional fuel was used. North America, as it turns out, is the world's first ECA for both SOx and NOx. The ECAs that exist in Europe are just cover uh, sulfur and SOx. The U.S. Canadian application was approved in 2010. It was followed shortly thereafter by a similar application to cover uh, the U.S. properties, uh, uh, islands in the Caribbean. The key in implementation dates here going forward are 2015, uh, the, the next and final drop in sulfur to the 0.1% level and the implementation of the Tier 3 NOx standards in 2016. It covers all ships within 200 nautical miles of most of the U.S. and Canadian coasts and then areas around the, the uh, Caribbean islands as well. EPA, which really led the charge along with the Coast Guard for the ECA, has estimated that the North American ECA will provide substantial air quality, economic, and health benefits quickly by 2020. Uh, this is not a program that takes 20 years to really see the benefits. From an air quality perspective, by 2020 we'll see marine emissions of NOx, fine particulates, and SOx on the order of 23%, 74%, and 86% respectively. Economic benefits will be substantial. Net monetized health benefits on an annual basis, in other words, including costs, uh, are estimated by EPA to be as much as $107 billion a year uh, by 2020. And the health benefits of all this are substantial. Up to 14,000 premature deaths eliminated, and eliminated annually by 2020 and up to 31,000 uh, by 2030, making this program 
uh, one of the most uh, important programs uh, from a health and air quality perspective that EPA has adopted in the, in the last 20 years. Now, getting into the specifics of LNG for a moment, we've found and increasingly seeing that LNG can be a, a cost-effective solution for achieving e eco compliance. Basically, ship owners and operators are looking at three, uh, three main approaches. Option one is LNG. Uh, the pros there are fairly obvious, meeting the SOX, the PM, and the Tier 3 NOx requirements without any added emission controls whatsoever, and potentially the lowest overall cost due to the low-cost fuel, which I'll talk about in a moment. Of course, there are initial capital costs, and there are fuel storage and bunkering issues, which we'll talk about as we go on, and those, get tend those we'll see resolved on a case-by-case -case basis. The second option is to switch to a low-sulfur fuel oil, um, in the eco zone, and you know the pro there, of course, is there's no extra in infrastructure needed other than the onboard storage of that second fuel. The con, of course, are significantly higher fuel costs. There are some concerns about availability, and to meet the 2016 NOx standard, scrubbers or some after treatment will still be needed. And the third option is to combine the continued use of high sulfur fuel with a more advanced emission control technology. The pros here is scrubber technology is, is mature. The fuel and bunkering obviously is available. There are fuel costs that are higher than LNG but lower than a low sulfur uh, conventional fuel. But the cons are, of course, the fuel cost issue, the capital cost of emissions equipment. Uh, if SCR is, is chosen as a technology, um, uh, the cost and, and the availability of the waste disposal infrastructure for the urea that would be used. <clears throat> So when we look at the fuel side, we really do see LNG emerging, not just as the lowest cost fuel option now, but projected out into the foreseeable future. You can see on the right here, a comparison of natural gas, residual fuel oil, and distillate fuel oil stretching out to 2035. And what this tells us is, of course, what we're already seeing at the pump today, which is that uh, because of the, the supply of natural gas in North America, really decoupling from the global oil market in, in recent years uh, from a price perspective and a supply pers perspective in North America, we see a long-term trend of cheaper natural gas. That's not the only part of it, though. The other part is that many refineries are blending high-cost, ultra-low sulfur diesel that they're using for their land-based engines, and they're combining that high-cost ULST with lower-cost high-sulfur fuels to achieve eco-compliant levels. So that's a that is creating a, a very high cost fuel, and it might meet the, the availability constraints that they have, but it does lead to a higher cost fuel. Uh, that's the other part of the picture here. Going forward and thinking about whether it makes sense for vessels to switch over to LNG, I think the three key factors are the share of the time in the eco zone will really determine the, uh, the long-term cost and benefits of an LNG approach. The price differential between LNG and the conventional fuel, of course, is an obvious one. And the third is, of course, the investment costs for the LNG tank system and other infrastructure. The bottom line is that if these fuel prices stay roughly the way they're projected, the tank system and infrastructure costs are reasonable, and the vessel spending a lot of time in the ECA, LNG is a fantastic way to go. So to start to wrap it all up, we're looking into the future, into the near future, the future we can already see. And we see that the eco requirements combined with the lower costs that we're seeing are already increasing the U.S. market for LNG. We project, based on the research we've done, the people we talk to, the companies we work with, 40 additional LNG vessels operational by 2017 across a wide range of types and sizes of vessels from, from ferries to dry bulk to container ships, tankers, oil supply vessels, and, and railroads. And we're not the only ones. DNV, which does great work in this space, projects that 5% of the total marine fuel sold in North America will be LNG by 2020. So wrap, wrapping it all up, what that means is we have now have a regulatory structure in place thanks to the 2008 amendments to MARPOL Annex 6, which creates an opportunity, an imperative really, for much cleaner ships around North America within 200 miles of our coasts. That ECA is the, is the first ECA in the world for both SOX and NOx, and that's, combined, that's combining to create uh, the opportunity for LNG as a cost-effective compliance strategy 
throughout the North American ECA, especially for vessels that are spending most of their time in ECA. What does it mean in one, in one sentence? We think LNG is poised for an expanded role in the U.S. marine market. And, uh, and I think that what the stage I've said here really leads us next to Paul Hergesell, who, as previously mentioned, he's the director of LNG logistical operations for Pivotal LNG. Paul brings more than 25 years of experience in the cryogenics industry, including plant engineering, production, and distribution of LNG and other cryogenic gases. He's been responsible for the construction of merchant liquefiers, the maintenance and operation of gas production plants and liquefiers, and managing a 24-7 cryogenic tr trucking operations. Uh, so I'm going to pass the baton to Paul, but before he begins, I just want to quickly remind you to continue submitting questions. I see them popping up on the screen. Uh, continue doing so. I pass it over now to Paul. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Rich, and uh, thanks, everyone, for the opportunity uh, to speak today. Um, I want to discuss a little bit about two topics uh, related to marine LNG fuel. Uh, one is cover uh, some of the methods for bunkering LNG, and then secondly, uh, hit on some of uh, overview of the, uh, the regulatory uh, issues. Um, I think we're all familiar with these forward-looking statements here. Um, in summary, what this means is that uh, Paul is not very good at predicting the future, and uh, that's definitely an accurate statement. Um, I'm uh, with Pivotal LNG, so let me start by explaining a little bit about who we are and our role in the LNG industry and how it relates to the uh, marine LNG business. Uh, Pivotal LNG is a part of uh, AGL Resources, which is uh, a natural gas company with activities in distribution, uh, retail, and midstream operations, as well as wholesale services, and we have approximately uh, four and a half million uh, customers. We also have um, 40 plus years of LNG operating experience. And as um, Pivotal LNG, our primary uh, mission here is to provide firm LNG supply to the merchant market or the end user market as some people refer to it. Uh, currently we have the largest liquefaction capacity in the United States. We have five LNG liquefiers and a sixth uh, new one under construction in Jacksonville. And we have 94 million gallons of uh, LNG storage. And here's just a map of uh, the locations of the liquefiers. And if you look on the lower right there, you'll see the new one that's going into uh, Jacksonville. And this one's going to be a key uh, supply point for uh, the marine LNG uh, fuel business. And so that's probably a good point to just kind of segue into uh, um, talking about LNG as a marine fuel. Um, obviously, there's a growing interest in uh, marine LNG uh, as a fuel um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, as Rich described, uh, you know, the requirements for uh, emissions in the emission control area um, are uh, tightening, and LNG is definitely a, com uh, um, a cost-effective way to uh, comply with those uh, requirements. Also, due to the uh, abundance of natural gas in North America and also potentially in other parts of the world, uh, that makes uh, LNG also a very cost competitive uh, fuel. Um, when we talk about LNG experience in the marine world, uh, it's important to note that there's 50 plus years of operating and transportation of LNG in the bulk carrier side of things. And that includes using LNG boil off as a fuel. And that experience has been the basis for you know, a significant uh, amount of development around procedures and systems for the safe handling of LNG. But now I would describe that we are entering into a new era where LNG is, is utilized in a, a wider variety of shipping applications than just the bulk business. And to date, that experience has been mostly uh, focused in Europe. However, there are some very uh, new and exciting and unique projects that are happening in the U.S. that uh, are really going to have an impact on uh, LNG acceptance. And just to talk about those, um, we'll have our first uh, LNG ship here in the United States uh, in the fall uh, when Harvey Gulf puts the first of several of their uh, offshore supply uh, vessels in service. 
And then also, um, Tote uh, Sea Star is building the first two container ships in the world to be powered by uh, LNG, and those will be operating out of uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And this is a, a significant uh, um, uh, change or uh, event here for a couple reasons. One, container ships are obviously a large class of ships that are operating widely throughout the uh, the world, and they also uh, require large amounts of fuel. So this is going to create some new uh, a need for some new uh, bunkering solutions in order to handle that uh, amount of fuel. And so when we look at LNG as a fuel in general, it has obviously some unique characteristics because it is a cryogenic uh, liquid. But in the marine applications, there are even some more specific challenges. And as we talked about, the bunkering volumes uh, are getting larger, and events that can be 200,000 gallons or more require different systems than land-based type of LNG uh, refueling. And also on the marine side, uh, uh, we're, we're, we're talking about working ships here, so bunkering while managing passenger or cargo loading, which is referred to as simultaneous operations, is a critical factor in developing and designing your systems for uh, bunkering and also development of uh, your procedures. On the safety and security side, Obviously very important in any kind of uh, LNG application, but when you're dealing at port facilities, you have even more extensive uh, requirements around the, those parameters. So uh, let's just kind of go through an overview of some of the, the bunkering methods that are out there. I classify them as either dockside or uh, waterside. And on the dock side, you have at least three different methods of doing this, one by tanker truck, uh, by a tank installed at or uh, near the dock, and then also by ISO containers. Uh, from the water side option, you obviously would have a vessel involved, but there's several different types of uh, storage configurations, pressure tanks, ISO containers, or, uh, or a membrane storage. So these these bunkering solutions so far tend to be very specific and unique depending on the application. So uh, each one has to be looked at uh, specifically on its own. But some of the key factors that you're going to consider when you're designing or selecting the bunkering method is obviously the volume, as we've talked about, how much do you have to bunker per event. Um, this question of simultaneous operations, you know, what activity is going to be taking place around the bunkering and can the bunkering be safely designed to accommodate that, uh, that other activity. Physical space, especially around the dock, is always a key uh, parameter. And then some of these are, are more straightforward or have less infrastructure to implement. So it may be also the, the ease and speed uh, at which you can implement them may have some uh, impact on your uh, decision. So I'll just try and go through um, the different methods, and we'll talk a little bit about just sort of the, uh, the pros and cons of each here, starting with um, uh, the dock side from a tanker truck to a ship. This method is well suited to smaller volumes and has the benefit of only tying up the dock space during the bunker event, so it's sort of a, a temporary use of the space. However, that also has sort of a drawback because it can also be difficult to really establish a safe bunkering zone in that temporary amount of time in which you've got good control over, you know, the surrounding activities and the surrounding personnel who may be doing totally different things and that you need to make sure and watch out for as the bunkering takes place. And obviously, as you can see, the, the, the filling takes place through a hose connection to the vessel, so obviously the tanker has to be rather close, and again, that may, be, uh, may impact on what's, uh, what's happening as far as uh, the, the cargo loading activities. On the tank to ship, uh, this is a view of the system that uh, Harvey Gulf uh, has installed. And in this approach, you have fixed tanks, which is you know, well suited to larger volumes because you can size the tanks to whatever your need is. And it doesn't use up space in the immediate dock area. 
And since you have uh, a permanent installation, you have good control of the bunkering area, good control of you know ingress and egress, and uh, a safety area for for monitoring that. Of course, what happens when you have a, a permanent installation? You do take up a fixed amount of space, uh, which is is valuable in the dock or the terminal area. And it's not just for the tanks as well. As you see, you have to have a way to fill the tanks, so there has to be some access, typically for uh, for trucking, uh, to be able to do that. I would say overall, this is a this is a very good approach when you have a single user or a dedicated dock where you have good control of the site. Obviously a little more complicated on a container terminal or a, a busy multi-use type of terminal. We have other entities doing a lot of uh, a lot of work at the same time. All right, here's a, a third dockside uh, approach here. And this uh, concept is using the ISO containers as a replaceable or a portable fuel tank uh, for the vessel. Um, it has the advantages that the ISO containers are already approved for LNG service, and you know they're readily transported and uh, and handled, and makes them easy to be you know uh, moved to uh, a remote location for filling, and they're certainly very easy to be handled at a container terminal. If you're not at a container terminal, much more difficult because these are especially uh, uh, heavy containers. And they're also a challenging approach for larger volumes because you have to handle these, you have to disconnect the empty ones and reconnect the, the full ones. All right, so um, and then we get to the other uh, category here on the water side option. This, of course, includes a bunkering barge, uh, and there's several different types uh, on that approach. There's also several different approaches as far as storage goes, and you can see uh, three of them here. Uh, in the lower left is a pressure tank barge, or what's referred to as a sea tank type barge, and you can see that there's two uh, storage tanks on this barge. This is a design by uh, Jensen Maritime. In the center, you see a barge that's using ISO containers, and these containers can be either fixed or movable off the barge. For, so there's a couple different uh, refueling options uh, on that approach, and this is uh, designed by Argent Marine. And then uh, on the right side, uh, you can see there is a, um, a membrane storage type uh, barge, and this is designed by uh, GTT. Uh, these options are are well suited to larger volumes. Uh, they are conceptually similar to petroleum bunkering, but I would say practically very different. Um, and because we're dealing with a cryogenic liquid, uh, the design uh, uh, has some special parameters, selection of materials is critical, and then we have a whole different set of procedures and crew training that's required for uh, this type of uh, bunkering activity. As a result, uh, the, the process and the regulatory oversight is still under development uh, for, uh, for really for most bunkering, but especially for uh, this type. And then I'll also add the other point that since these uh, types of bunker barges can handle larger volumes, it also requires a way to be filled and has a need for the whole upstream infrastructure to be sized and capable of moving um, larger volumes of LNG uh, to the port facility. Okay, um, let me just uh, kind of switch over here and talk a little bit about uh, regulation on, on the, the impact there. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, we have a long history and experience with LNG operating from the bulk carrier activities. However, this experience is focused in a specific type of operations. And when you look at the bulk business, you know, it's characterized by large volumes of imported LNG um, occurring or arriving on relatively infrequent intervals, arriving at specialized facilities, usually at very isolated locations. And so for this specific type of situation, we have a very well-developed regulatory framework, and it's been in place uh, for quite some time. 
but as as we've mentioned here, LNG as a marine fuel is changing into a, a different era here. It's a, it's a different kind of environment. So it is different than LNG handling in the bulk business in some ways. We're dealing with much smaller volumes uh, and much more frequent events. As we've talked about, the simultaneous operations is a very key issue uh, because now we have bunkering activity that's taking place around many other types of activity, especially uh, with the, the cargo handling. So this uh, suggests here uh, a need for regulations that are specific to this new era, this new operating environment for uh, um, uh, LNG as a marine fuel, and the Coast Guard has recognized the need for uh, flexibility. And if you haven't already, I would recommend reviewing these two uh, Coast Guard policy letters listed here to understand both the interpretation from the regulatory side, but also you'll see uh, some of the options that the Coast Guard has provided for looking at alternative approaches and, and trying to uh, achieve that flexibility that's, uh, that's needed. Um, and I guess, uh, you know, most importantly, I think we all want to emphasize the LNG industry has had an excellent safety and security history. We want to keep, uh, keep uh, maintaining and improving that, and we want to continue to work uh, um, in that direction for all of us uh, in the industry. So this is just a little bit uh, of an overview here. Um, I know that uh, there will be much more detailed uh, presentations and some case studies at the High Horsepower Conference, and I think uh, Rich will talk some more about that uh, later on. And then um, I think uh, we're going to have questions at the end, but here's my uh, contact information, and uh, anyone can feel free to contact me directly if you have questions uh, after the program. And uh, thank you. Great. Th thank you so much, Paul. That was really, really great. A lot of great detail there and food for thought. Next, we're going to hear from Joris Van Kriege, who is the Global Sales Manager of Ship Fueling Solutions from Chart Industries. Joris joins us from his home office in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm sure he's very happy about how the World Cup is proceeding, and where he is <laughs> responsible for Chart's marine LNG fueling solutions portfolio. Joris brings more than 10 years of experience in propulsion systems with a broad knowledge of ship design, engine room, and bridge systems. He has worked with numerous marine operations to launch LNG-fueled vessels around the world, and he'll be sharing some details from the projects that he's worked on and others. Again, if you have any questions for any of our webinar speakers, please submit them uh, to the Q&A session using the box in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, Joris, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Rich. Um, let me just see how I can go there. Okay, there we go. Uh, yeah, thank you uh, all very much for, of course, for attending. And I'll be uh, showing and uh, give you an overview on uh, on charts uh, activities, uh, mostly on uh, LNG ship fueling. I'll start with a company overview on uh, for for those of you who are not aware of us or, or our organization. Then I'll go deeper into our ship fuel systems and the features that we have on our uh, on our solutions. Um, the fuel tank alternatives is, is, a, is a part about the concepts, the different concepts or the type of concepts that we are developing right now. Um, uh, part of that is also um, uh, uh, what Paul was, uh, was uh, relating to in terms of fixed tanks and containers, etc. We'll talk more about that. And then some uh, real-life projects that we have been uh, active in. So as a whole chart industries, um, we are headquartered in Cleveland, Ohio, and then we have three divisions uh, worldwide, energy and chemicals, distribution and storage, and biomedical. Uh, the LNG ship fueling uh, team is part of the distribution and storage uh, department, and energy and chemicals is um, um, mostly uh, active in the uh, um, liquefaction plants and the LNG um, uh, braced aluminum heat exchanges, for example, for, uh, for, for cold boxes, et cetera, uh, in that type of uh, industries. Biomedical is, uh, is the, the, the medical side, so um, oxygen systems, for example, or lab storage systems. Um, overall, I mean, uh, chart overall is, a, is, a, is our, our core activities are cryogenics, 
So that's why you have these diverse um, applications that we are active in. Distribution and storage is our largest group. Um, we are uh, we have uh, uh, different locations in Europe, in the U.S., and also in uh, Shangzhou in in China. Ship fueling um, is mostly done uh, or at least developed in uh, Dutch in Czech Republic and also New Prague in uh, in uh, in U.S. Uh, 5, 000, uh, uh, 5,100 employees in over uh, 15 countries and the yearly revenue is about uh, 1.2 billion US just to have a, an overview. I'll go rather quickly past these slides. We have some uh, some other more interesting uh, things to show you. Um, distribution and storage, so this is an overview of, of our uh, products uh, or at least some examples. Uh, trailers, uh, vacuum insulated piping, flow meters, um, vehicle fuel tanks, ISO containers, rail cars we're also developing, uh, so it's, uh, it's pretty diverse. These are the larger type of pro products, um, uh, larger evaporation plants or satellite uh, plants for industrial use or for filling up uh, trailers. Uh, we have uh, um, uh, fueling stations and um, you see here also some of our standard equipment, uh, our standard tank portfolio. Uh, the largest uh, vacuum insulated tank uh, ever built uh, by Chart, but also worldwide, is this one, uh, 1,000 cubic meter. Uh, this was used in a plant in uh, in Oslo, in Norway, for an, an uh, well, this was a, a multi-purpose plant evaporation station, but also can be used for bunkering and for uh, filling trailers. So it's a it's a it's a multi-purpose uh, facility. Um, well, we're active in the whole LNG value chain, so from production of LNG, the liquefaction of LNG, to distribution, the different kind of ways of distributing, small-scale uh, distribution of, of LNG, infrastructure, so the, 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 the infrastructure we're developing in terms of stations, plants, um, uh, uh, retail stations uh, for fueling, and then we have end-user applications uh, like uh, vehicle fueling, but also uh, ship fueling. So to go deeper into a, a ship fuel system, or at least a, a typical or most conventional uh, ship fuel system, uh, this is a, more or less an overview. So you have obviously the, the vacuum insulated tanks uh, with coal box. Uh, the coal box means uh, it's a it's a it's a gas tight enclosure which holds the evaporation equipment, and then we have the piping uh, to the um, to the um, uh, to the gas valve units of the engines. Um, we have then on the starboard and port side the bunkering stations with the double walled or vacuum insulated piping to the uh, to the tanks. Uh, a part of that you have also the gas control system and the gas safety system and a water glycol circuit uh, which is uh, used for heating up the LNG and, evapor and being able to evaporate it. The water glycol is then also evaporate or uh, heated up by the um, uh, either cooling water or uh, exhaust gases or thermal oil can be different uh, sources of, of heat. This is a principal diagram of, uh, of such a, a system. So you have the double wall tank uh, with, a, with the cold box. All the penetrations uh, in the tank are single walled. So that's why we have this cold box enclosure, which means inside this cold box, you, it's, a, it's a gas hazardous area with all the safety measures that need to be taken into account. And outside, it's it's gas safe, so more or less a, a conventional engine room space, um, uh, and that's also the reason why outside this cold box, all the piping is double walled. So we, we have the vacuum insulated piping from the bunkering station, which is double walled, and also the engine lines to the gas valve units are, are also double walled, which means which means it's a it's a it's a gas safe area outside of this uh, uh, this system. As I said, this is the most conventional way. There are, there are different ways. Of doing it, but uh, so far this is the, the the concept that we've seen the most in the uh, in the industry and also in our solutions. This is what we have uh, uh, furthest developed. Uh, tank positioning uh, below deck. So, well, these are just the rules which we which we have um, for the uh, for the height above the uh, the ship's bottom and uh, and the sides, uh, be over 15 or two meter. And be over five or eleven point five meter. Um, well, these are known uh, known rules. Um, actually, they are also being challenged. Um, we, I'm uh, also participating in a study 
in the Netherlands by a research institute where we are actually looking at the uh, um, uh, the weakness of an LNG fuel tank and actually it's uh, the, the the results so far are that this 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 type of tank of vacuum insulated C type tank is actually pretty strong and um, these rules are actually based on uh, on, on collision uh, statistics and the and the uh, the amount of penetration that you have during a collision and it's actually assuming that once the tank is touched that it's also uh, breached or at least that you have a, a, a leakage of LNG and this this assumption is uh, is in our in our view not correct so there could be in the future uh, a change on these rules that's that's at least what we're hoping for. Um, tank design. So you can see here, this is a, a, skin, a, a conceptual way of, of how we uh, manufacture our tanks. So you see a, a conical uh, support, which is very strong support uh, of the uh, uh, of the inner tank, and it allows for the thermal contraction and, and expansions. And then on the other side, on the right side, you see straps. Um, there are several of those, uh, which also allows for those um, uh, movements uh, in, in in the longitudinal way. Um, on the on the side where you have the cold box, so on the left side, that's also of course where you have all the penetration because it's that's the fixed side uh, by the uh, by the conical support. Um, so that's that's where you have all those uh, all the all the, uh, the the penetrations going in and out of the uh, of the cold box. Um, then we have two supports on the on the bottom. Uh, again, on the left side is a is a fixed support uh, which is really uh, firm. And then on the other side, it's a sliding support, so it still supports the tank, and it also um, prevents it from floating in case of a in case of a sinking ship, for example. Uh, but it allows for uh, for the uh, for the thermal contraction expansion in a longitudinal way, and also some torsional uh, forces are allowed there. Um, safety features, so we have inside this cold box uh, gas detection, liquid leak detection, fire detection. It's 10 to 30 air changes per hour. This is purely a, 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 a class requirement. All the walls, they are uh, protected against fire from the inside uh, and or outside. It's all from stainless steel, obviously, to uh, be able to withstand the cryogenic temperatures. The key connections are fill closed and the vents are fill open. Um, Piping outside of the cold box, either vacuum insulated or the purge double wall. Um, I talked about that. Fixed tanks and, uh, and cold boxes. So this is the most uh, conventional way. Uh, you can see here a picture of Fjord One ferries, uh, which we uh, supplied tanks for in 2006. Uh, it's uh, it's always of co obviously it's always a tailor-made solution. This this, this cannot really be standardized. Um, I'll show some some other. Uh, examples later on. ISO containers, um, well, it's obviously a, it's a flexible solution. It has different means of bunkering, as uh, Paul also um, uh, talked about. Um, we have this uh, uh, this solution available, type approved by uh, Bureau of Veritas at the moment, uh, for 20 feet and 40 feet uh, uh, containers. It goes up to uh, 43 cubic meters. You can see here a picture of the power barge in Hamburg, uh, which is a project that we're working on right now. I will uh, uh, give you some more details uh, later on in, in this presentation. The trailers, well, this is another, uh, well, more more unconventional way, I would say. Uh, I've only seen this so far on uh, conceptual uh, projects and, and, and only one project where this is actually becoming more reality. Uh, so you're actually using a trailer to to go on board. So it's a row row operation, and uh, and and then install it inside a garage or uh, a place where it's becoming a, a part of the ship, and it and it, it becomes a, a, an LNG fuel tank. Very uh, innovative and quite some uh, challenges in terms of uh, regulations and 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 how to 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 fix, of course, this uh, this tank to the ship. Um, but it can be, uh, in some cases, an interesting and, and, and good feasible option. Then uh, moving on to the to the project that we have done so far. So this is one uh, which was mentioned before, of course, uh, and, and, and very well known. I, I would say Harvey Gulf, um, where we are providing uh, three tanks for the first three ships. Um, these are 290 cubic meter 
horizontal tanks and in this case we are cooperating with Watsila who is providing the whole uh, LNG pack as they call it. Um, so we're, we're delivering the whole, uh, 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 the bare tank I would say and um, uh, we're making the attachment of the, uh, of the tank to the call box. Um, I have some pictures of this, of this, uh, of this uh, solution. We are right now delivering these for these first three, three tanks. So the first one has been delivered. Um, these are some uh, computed, computed uh, images, and here's some uh, some pictures of our workshop. We have um, uh, used multi-layer insulation, so super insulation. It means layers of uh, aluminium foil uh, wrapped around the inner tank, and they are uh, separated. Uh, these layers are of, of aluminium foil are separated by layers of um, a glass fiber paper, um, which is a which which forms a very very strong a very uh, um, uh, high insulation uh, material together uh, uh, in combination with uh, with vacuum. Then another concept or another project that we have uh, provided the tanks and actually the whole system was this uh, Francisco um, Catamaran for Bucabus in uh, Argentina. Um, many of you may probably have seen this uh, in, in, in news articles. Um, here we are providing the whole solution, so not only the tanks, but also the cold boxes with the vaporizers, the pumps, valves, bunker stations, the, the heat management of the turbine exhaust gases, which are uh, the source of heat for uh, evaporating the LNG. Um, yeah, a very, very innovative uh, project um, because it, we're using here gas turbines. Uh, the ship is using gas turbines, uh, two times 22 megawatts, so we needed a lot of pressure and a lot of flow of LNG of, of gas to the to the engines which is also the reason why we needed to use pumps uh, to provide this uh, this pressure uh, because normally in a, in a conventional four stroke application you do not need pumps in case of a C type tank where you can use the, the pressure of the tank as a, as a means of, of, of maintaining the pressure uh, of maintaining the flow to the uh, to the gas valve unit and actually then you're using a pressure build-up unit to, to maintain the pressure of the tank. So uh, here this is a different concept where we have to use pumps because of the higher pressure uh, up to about uh, 30 bar. Uh, some images of the, uh, of the situation inside the ship. So there are, so there are two, two fuel systems, two propulsion trains, I would say, on, on, the, on each side of the, of the, of the ship. Um, this is the um, image of the, uh, of the of our system of our tank with the cold box attached. So you can see here also the fixed support on the right side and on the left the uh, uh, the movable support of the tank. And this is a rendering of the of the cold box with inside the the, uh, the evaporator and the pumps and the valves, etc. This is how it went on transportation. So we could still move this uh, partially by uh, road. It's a relatively small system if you compare it to other uh, ship fuel systems. Then uh, the containerized uh, solution, the power barge, um, this will be operating in the port of Hamburg. And this barge is uh, actually a, uh, 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 a barge with gensets on, on, on board. So it has generators running on LNG. And we are providing here two um, uh, ISO containers, 40 feet, and uh, so-called gas processing unit. So the containers are connected to those, uh, so to these, to this uh, gas processing unit, and um, uh, delivering the gas to the uh, to the engines. Uh, it's a pretty innovative project in the way that uh, this is operating. Uh, this this barge will be going alongside uh, in the port of Hamburg to a, to an Aida cruise liner, and so this cruise liner can. Um, stop their uh, their diesel engines while in port. So it's it's purely for uh, for reducing the emissions in the port of uh, Hamburg in this case. Right now we are building this uh, uh, these containers. It's due for operation this summer. That's uh, in short what I wanted to uh, wanted to show to you uh, as as real life projects that we're working on. Um, there's a lot of different as you can see there's a lot of different concepts out there that uh, that can be utilized so it's really in any project that uh, that we come across it's uh, 
really uh, and uh, again it's a it's a new development of uh, of of a, of a new system so it's not really a standard way of doing things there's always different uh, uh, it's always important to to keep that open that, that open view and uh, well i hope this uh, this gave you some inspiration and of, of course i'm ready to answer your questions and you're free to contact me i believe you will get my contact details also from uh, uh, from rich or uh, uh, yeah, I think from Rich, but you'll you'll get my my contact information, and then uh, I'd be happy to to help you further. Thank you very much, Joris. Thank you very much for that presentation. There's a lot of great information in there. I'm looking at the clock and seeing that we only have a few minutes. Time is short, so what I, what I we've got about 20 some odd questions that have come in. We won't be able to handle all of them. So at the outset, I'll just suggest that. If you've asked a question, we don't have a chance to get to it, please email the uh, presenter directly. I'm sure we're all uh, eager to help answer all the questions that you have. Uh, in the short time we have, though, let me just start with a quick question for Yoris since you just finished. Uh, it's really mm -hmm. a quick three-part question. Uh, first, okay. the LNG trailers, what is the shelf life of the LNG in the containers? Second. Are they suitable for small marine bunkering? And third, what can you share with us about uh, your, your knowledge on methane slip levels from those engines while in operation? Yeah, so you mean the shelf life of the LNG, you mean the holding time, I guess, of these uh, containers, right? That's, tr that's right. Right, yeah, so the holding time well, obviously depends on, uh, on, on, on the way that the fuel is, or the LNG is being fueled. It goes up to 80 days and that we specify. It can even be longer. This really depends on, uh, on, uh, on, 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 the, on the temperature, the saturation pressure of, uh, of how you're filling up these containers. But 80 days is, uh, is, is uh, very easily possible. Yeah. Um, regarding the, um, uh, the methane slip, well, that was the third question, but the methane slip, um, this is something that I cannot really comment on as we're not really experts on, uh, on engines. And uh, and I hear a lot of different values for that, so I don't want to go into that uh, detail. And of course, it depends on supplier and engine type. So I I'm afraid I don't have an answer on that. What was the second question you had? The second question had to do with the whether these uh, containers were suitable for small marine bunkering. For small marine bunkering, so you mean uh, so using the container to actually supply to a ship. Uh, yes, yeah. very well. They are they are poss they are they are useful for that. Well, we are in our uh, um, our product portfolio. We have standard ISO containers, so we are uh, I think in Europe the largest ISO container manufacturer. So we we have a lot of experience with building these containers for roads, uh, rail, uh, sea applications. So these are of course uh, uh, very heavy environments. This is the normal uh, transportation container. Right now we took we took such a container and we've uh, uh, made it available for as used as a ship fuel tank. So that means it's uh, the same same rules and regulations as for road transport, but also now it can be applied as a ship fuel tank. So it has the class rules approvals on top of that. Um, so it's a normal transportation or LNG container and it can also be used for bunkering. Uh, but obviously, what you need to do then is, uh, is have uh, some additional equipment on, on uh, either pressurizing the, uh, the, the container or using a pump to, uh, to, to, to bunker the ship. So it's not, it cannot be used as a standalone unit for bunkering, but it can be used normally like a, like a trailer supply for, for bunkering operations. So yes, uh, that's possible with a pump skit, for example. Great, thank you. And now I'll pivot to Paul. Uh, I think a, a good question came in with respect to your pivotal LNG plants and whether you can share which process technologies you've selected for your plants. And do you have any words of wisdom with regards to the less, some of the lessons you've learned, some of the performance you've seen, uh, pros and cons, and so on? Yeah, sure. Um, I'd say uh, there's um, probably a general trend that up to 150,000 gallons per day type of uh, liquefier is a, a liquid nitrogen uh, cycle plant. And above that, you get into uh, uh, mixed refrigerant uh, type plants. And 
basically um, in the smaller plants, um, you know, liquid nitrogen is not quite as efficient, but it's a simple design, very robust, uh, easy to start up and uh, and off and run. And as you get into a bigger plant, then the, the efficiency, you know, uh, the value of the efficiency is uh, a little bit more important. So uh, mixed refrigerant and in in several different combinations, but uh, generally it's going to give you uh, more savings on the operating side. Great, great, great. Here's a question for everybody. I think it comes up in, in, in every discussion of an LNG marine application, um, and it really goes to the question of how do we address uh, community or other concerns that have been raised about siting, natural gas, uh, fueling, bunkering, storage, in port environments uh, near communities. And I, I think everybody has had experience in this area. Uh, so the, the question specifically was how do we overcome arguments about LNG, CNG, and, and NG in port environments? How far does the facility need to be away from population centers and other marine facilities? But I think it's a broader question um, that maybe everybody can share a thought or two on. Let me just also say we do have many, many questions, and I and I will uh, I can see how many people are still on the webinar. We'll stay on for you know a, a, a little bit more time, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. We'll keep an eye on the clock for you all, um, so we can we can answer some more of the questions. Uh, so with that, Paul, yours uh, your thoughts on addressing um, concerns that are raised in the siting of uh, natural gas in port environments. Right. Well, yeah, this is a really a uh, difficult question. Of course, it's really dependent on on the uh, on on local uh, authorities or or or, uh, or flag states, etc. Um, what we see in in Norway, it's uh, they're they're pretty relaxed about about uh, about that, and um, uh, it really depends on 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 with 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 whom you are talking, really, and and with which uh, authority or. Uh, you're actually um, uh, talking because these things also change very, very rapidly. Um, for example, we uh, earlier, like maybe two years ago, it was not really allowed to have um, um, uh, passenger operations on a ferry in a, on a ferry while you are bunkering. And then uh, one year ago, I think the uh, the Viking race started, and they were able to do that. So. This is rapidly changing, and and it really depends on from port to port, I would say. Um, so yeah, this is always a, a case by case uh, thing, I would say. Yeah, and I would say um, in our experience is that uh, um, the biggest issue is um, lack of information and lack of understanding, you know, from the general public. When they have concerns about LNG, they're just really not familiar with it. And because obviously it is a very safe fuel and it has a very, uh, very good track record that way. So for us, the biggest thing is outreach. You, you got to go out and educate people about uh, what it is really all about. And, and one of the things we have done is, is we will invite uh, uh, folks, uh, especially the uh, the regulatory folks or city officials to the facilities, and we'll give them a demonstration on the handling and the properties of LNG, and also show them, you know, what these types of facilities are like, that uh, they're extremely safety conscious and the design of them is very oriented that way. And when people see how LNG is safely handled, I mean, most of the time we've had, uh, you know, very good success on, on educating people that way. But for us, it's, it's really just getting the information out there. you got to go talk to people. I think that's great advice. And I think if I were to add another, uh, you know, another few bullet points, so they would all be under the heading of public education community outreach, really getting out there and, and filling in the information gaps that are out there. Um, I think in most port settings, uh, LNG is still, in, is still a new idea for people who live nearby, uh, and, uh, and I think public education and outreach and communicate, good communications is, is really, really key to success. I got a couple questions to me, so I'll answer those together. I'll be both... Uh, moderator and presenter for a moment, but I was asked two questions that I think are useful for everybody. The first was, I don't understand why LNG will be only 5% of marine fuel in 2020 when um, we also say that burning marine gas oil won't meet the NOx uh, emission standards under Tier 3. The answer to that one, um, uh, really on the standard side, 
uh, goes to the second question I got, which is, will LNG-powered engines need SCR or catalysts to meet Tier 3 standards? And the answer is no, they won't, and that, ba and that backs into the first question. Uh, burning marine gas oil on its own won't meet Tier 3 NOx, and, and that's why we're, we're going to see SCR, we're going to see scrubbers, we're going to see advanced emission control technologies coming in to the vessels uh, that are built um, for the North American eco market. Uh, but LNG, one of the many advantages of LNG um, is that you don't need, you know, don't, you shouldn't need the, the SCR or the catalyst to meet those standards. So the switch to this fuel switch will do the job. Um, the the let me uh, bring it bring the questions back to some of the technical questions we have in the time we left. The question was, do we have any reference standards on fuel specification? Uh, and that uh, including methane number, any limitations on nitrogen or inert contact, if anybody wants to tackle that one. Well, I uh, I would say um, I, I don't think we really have an industry standard. Uh, the various engine manufacturers, of course, have some standards of their own. So as a supplier, we try to, you know, comply with the, the or satisfy the requirements of the uh, the, the specific engine manufacturer. Um, nitrogen content, at least, you know, here in the U.S. or in our part of the U.S. has not really been that big of an issue or that part of people's specs. Uh, really, they spend more time uh, um, uh, or focusing on the, uh, the heavier hydrocarbon concentration in the fuel. Or that's where they have their concerns about ethane, right. propane. Where do you think on the, just following up, on the water side bunkering topic, what, what, where do you think the regulatory attention is uh, in the next couple of years that you're seeing in conversations and the projects you're involved in? Well, I, I would say that uh, since it's new to everyone, really, to us and to the Coast Guard, uh, everyone's kind of looking to work together and work through uh, some projects and kind of develop uh, some of the issues as we go. As I was mentioning, you know, we have a lot of regulations on the bulk side uh, focused on very large facilities, and we need to see how some of those get applied or modified for, uh, you know, the, the more direct bunkering activity. But um, where it's headed, I mean, I think we're, we're definitely going to come up with uh, some solutions here, and, and at, at least my perception with the Coast Guard is they're very interested in, in making this work and work safely, and uh, um, so they're, they're looking for uh, trying to get some of these projects, uh, you know, uh, through, the, through the steps and, and develop some of these. Right, right. You know, we have a, we have a similar question um, that asked about uh, spill containment. Uh, refueling spill containment, um, thermal radiation exclusion, vapor dispersion potential. Also, what, you know, asking about what provisions or considerations that do you see as being critical um, as you as you bring these projects to fruition. Yeah, well, it uh, certainly depends upon the uh, the method. Um, if you're gonna um, start putting a storage, fixed storage in uh, at a, um, a container terminal or any kind of terminal, then you're gonna get into some very specific uh, thermal radiation, vapor dispersion, NFPA 59A type uh, requirements. Uh, on the trucking side, it's not so clear uh, just yet. Uh, there's obviously different ways of doing it in different parts of the world. Um, I, I think that here in the United States, we're, we're going to have some uh, requirements around containment, even for a uh, tanker truck to, to ship uh, offloading. And I think that'll depend on the specific situation. Uh, if you're loading directly from the truck, if you're going to have ground pumps, um, you know, and, and what really is the activity around them. But uh, certainly there's going to be, uh, I believe, uh, some requirements on spill containment for, for that method as well. Great. You know, um, this is all great information. We do have a few more questions we haven't had a chance to get to. In particular, there were some questions that involved natural gas use in um, land-based engines, which I, I, uh, I urge uh, the folks who asked those questions to contact us directly. 
Uh, we're happy to talk about those issues. But we're just about out of time, so I want to start to wrap up. And I'm, I do apologize if we didn't address one of your qu questions today. I want to also extend our sincere thanks to Paul and Uris uh, for putting together great presentations and, and walking us through their real great body of uh, knowledge and experience and expertise. Please feel free to contact them if you have questions related to their presentations, or me, of course, if you have questions about mine. Uh, your, your, uh, you, you'll all get um, our, our presentation materials as well as our contact information in the next couple of days. We had more than 200 people uh, register to participate today. That shows us this fantastic interest in this topic uh, as a solution for both economic and environmental questions that are uh, in the marine industry right now. Uh, this conversation is going to continue at the HHP Summit this October in New Orleans. It's the 7th to the 9th. New Orleans is a fun city. Uh, October is a great time of year to be there, uh, and we encourage you to join us there and continue this conversation. Um, you will get a $50 uh, registration discount code if you come to the summit as a, as a uh, webinar participant. Uh, the code to use is WEBINAR50, all caps, WEBINAR50. Um, and, you know, it's, I guess I'll close by just noting that the summit is actually in a great hotbed of natural gas HHP activity. The Harvey Gulf uh, LNG vessel hit the water earlier this year, was mentioned earlier, and there's a number of different LNG production projects that are being developed along the Gulf Coast. So it's kind of a neat place, not just because New Orleans is a fun town, uh, to get together for uh, the HHP Summit. We'll have three days of tailored educational sessions. There's going to be a lot of networking opportunities, hosted receptions, tours to the Gulf Coast's uh, most uh, promising natural gas projects, and our biggest sh uh, uh, show floor yet, uh, which will showcase actual um, actual tires you can kick, uh, to use a phrase from the car world, um, all, all the uh, equipment and fueling supplier goods that are out there. So please um, take, a, take a look at the HHP website. Uh, this conversation will continue there, um, and it will continue in New Orleans. We hope we do see you. And uh, please take a sec before you uh, move on to your next uh, task for the day to complete the brief survey that will pop up once you exit the webinar window. And on that note, I'll say thank you all for your time um, and uh, to keep the World Cup theme going. I hope that whatever uh, team you're rooting for does great in the group of 16 and thereafter. Thanks again. <laughs>